Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I want to talk about the uh, concepts of arresting strangeness and cognitive estrangement. Now, there, there are technical aspects to this. There's a lot of depth and nuance to the discussion. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on uh, small elements of both that show them as kind of these parallel approaches to a technique that illustrates something that happens in science fiction and fantasy. So this is not a full in-depth discussion of arresting strangeness, which is what Tolkien came up with, and cognitive estrangement, which is what Darko Suvin came up with. It's more about how to turn them in these concepts into tools to help us think about the reading of science fiction and fantasy and the different ways and different effects that um, the different ways that authors use it and the different effects that they create or might be trying to create and it just it's it's a, a reading tool rather than the scholarly academic approach to these concepts, which I think you know is a bit fitting for this channel. But in essence, what this comes down to is, is trying to distill an aspect of what science fiction and fantasy do and different ways that we conceive of them. So before I get into arresting strangeness and cognitive estrangement, I want to talk a little bit about uh, mimesis to diegesis and mimesis to the fantastic. And that's going to sound weird, it's going to sound strange, but let me explain. So when we talk about fiction, one of the big things about fiction is fiction is not real. By definition, it is fiction. It is not real. It is made up. Even when it is based on real events, even when it's set in the real world based on an historical event, it's not real. It is a version of something. And quite often, a great illustration of why fiction isn't real is the expression, truth is stranger than fiction. Because what can happen in the real world can beggar belief. We can have coincidences that are so startling, that are so strange, or events that are so outlandish, that if we read it in a story, we would go, no, that doesn't make any sense. That's not believable. And the only reason it's believable at all in the real world is it actually happened. It was one of those bizarre coincidences that crops up at one time, one in a million. And we know that one in a million things happen nine times out of ten. Thank you, Terry Pratchett. But this is because reality is not bound by a lot of the rules and precepts and, and strictures and techniques and expectations that we have for narrative. So we don't really talk about the real, it's not real, when we're talking about fiction, because none of fiction is real. But what we can discuss is mimesis, it's mimetic qualities. And again, distilling down to just a basic point about it, mimesis is kind of mimicry. It mimics the real. It is a facsimile of the real, but it's not. It has been changed in some way. It is part artifice that things have been changed. Uh, aspects have been conflated or, or simplified to make it into an understandable narrative. So we talk about mimesis. We can talk about mimetic literature. And mimetic literature is stuff that resembles the real, but is not real. So when we read about, say, something uh, happening in London, or something happening in New York, and it's based on real events. It is a, a, and you're familiar with this from TV or from film, a dramatization of those events. That's not exactly what the people said. Those aren't the exact people. They may have conflated certain roles, they've streamlined things, they've cut things out, all to make it understandable. So it is mimetic rather than representative of the real. So on one side of the spectrum, we have something that is very closely mimicked are mirroring the real, is closely linked to the real, and that is mimesis. And then as we move further along, we get to something that is fully fictionalized, fully unreal, fully removed from the real, and we can call that the diegetic because it is fully narrative. There isn't an element of the real to it. It isn't mimicking the real in it. And that would be at the far end of the spectrum. And to be perfectly honest, there are very few narratives that are at that absolute polar end, because quite often authors have to use elements from the real, from the real world, to make even the most fantastic elements understandable in a, in a narrative. 
But those think of those as sort of the two binary points, the dyads at either end of a spectrum. And uh, all works fall somewhere between them, between mimesis and diegesis. The closer you get to story world, to the diegesis, the less connected you are to uh, the things that happen in the real. Now, there's an added dimension to this because we could have a story that is very much mundane, doesn't involve any fantasy elements, but it is entirely fabricated. It never happened. It's not set in a real city. It doesn't feature real people. It's not mimicking any of those things, but it appears very much mimetic in that it, it appears very much real. But no point of connection exists between that narrative and the actual world. And you can see there that that would be highly diegetic, but not particularly fantastic. It's very mundane. It would be diegetic and mundane. So we can think of a different axis running from mimesis to the fantastic, to these elements that are unreal, that are divorced from our reality, could not exist in our reality. So the instantaneous teleportation of people does not exist. Therefore, it is a fantastic element. Um, whereas the made up uh, company in an army is a mundane element, but just as fictional. It is just as unreal. It never existed and never will exist. So you can see the, the difference there. Fantastic elements. It's not about mimesis to diegesis. It's about mimesis to the fantastic. So these are two different ways of thinking about that change. So when we consider fantastic elements, we can go from uh, small fantastic elements inserted into a very mimetic reality. So think of the opening of a lot of urban fantasy series where there are a couple of one or two new things, one, of, uh, one or two new fantastic elements. So in the Southern Vampire Mysteries, oh look, vampires exist. There is a new fantastical element that's inserted into something that is meant to resemble the real world. So it's quite close to mimesis, but has a fantastic element. Then we think of, oh, well, later on in the Southern Vampire Mysteries, this, the Sookie Stackhouse books by um, is it Charlene Harris. As we get later on in that series, there's loads of supernatural creatures, in which case it is further and further away from mimesis and closer and closer to the fantastic. But if we had a book that was set entirely in, say, fairy, did not conform to our reality, didn't feature any human characters, uh, and had no point of connection to the real world, we could see that very much as very close to the fantastic and really far away from mimesis, from the mimetic. So you can see how that sort of spectrum functions. So now that we've we've discussed that, the reason I want to talk about this is because I want to talk about arresting strangeness and cognitive estrangement. And at the core, getting rid of all of the nuance and, and all of the uh, intricate bits of it, Tolkien came up with the idea of arresting strangeness when he was talking about the creation of a secondary world, when he was talking about this sub-creation and the creating of the fantastic. And quite often, it's framed in a way of creating a fantastic element that creates a sense of awe or wonder or is a sense of beauty in the reader about what is being created. It's a very positive aspect of this uh, fictional art. Darko Suvin, on the other hand, when he was talking about science fiction, was looking very much at cognitive estrangement. And you can tell from breaking up those two words, cognitive about mean understanding and the meaning of things, how we understand our cognition and estrangement, something that is strange, something that has been removed. And for Suvin, it was about a novum, a new thing. And this new thing in science fiction, when it is introduced, not only creates estrangement, that we are in a strange place, a strange world, a strange environment that is not our own, but the effect that it creates is it causes us to think about our world in a new way, in a new light, to reconceptualize what we already think we know, and it can give us insight into things that we readily accept. So I'm going to go through 
uh, a couple of different examples here to talk through them, to show uh, these different things and how it's not just that cognitive estrangement only applies to science fiction or that arresting strangeness only applies to fantasy, but they are two sort of almost parallel ways of thinking about the inclusion of the fantastic into narrative. So the first one that I want to talk about is this line from Beyond This Horizon by Heinlein. And it's, it's quite a famous line in science fiction. The door dilated. And in three words, Heinlein creates an entire science fictional universe because doors do not dilate. Now, it could be in in the, the modern world that we live in, someone has designed doors that dilate. But typically speaking, and particularly when this was written, doors didn't dilate, doors swung open. So by using the term dilated, by describing the, the action of the door as a dilation, Heinlein creates a science fictional reality. He creates a fantastic reality. He removes us from our reality and creates this new world. And so if we view it as a positive, as a wondrous thing, this is where we could maybe talk about Tolkien's concept of arresting strangeness, because the dilated is strange. It is weird. It is wonderful. And the door dilating makes us uh, consider this new world, this new fantastic reality, and it can be a very positive, wondrous, awe-inspiring event. And that's kind of what Tolkien is talking about. We are arrested, we are stopped at that full stop by that word dilated. And we reconsider and we think about this wondrous reality that's just been created. So it's the insertion of a word that causes this. Arresting, stopping, strangeness, dilating doors. But Suvin would frame this slightly differently. And Suvin would talk about it in terms of this is a new thing, a novum. Doors dilating is a new thing, a new technology that we don't have. And because of that, we are estranged. We are removed from our world. But a secondary element then is that it makes us reconsider and recontextualize what the concept of a door is. Because when we think of this dilation of a door, it makes us think of, well, how do doors normally function? What are the, the integral concepts of a door? How can a door dilate? If a door swings open or a door can be left ajar, all of these things that we never really think about. But how can we define the concept of a door now if doors can also dilate? And so this is kind of what Suvin was talking about, a novum that is introduced into the narrative that makes us recontextualize and rethink about what a door is and it causes this uh, moment where cognition and intellect and meaning are all engaged to rethink and we can see a similar thing here in this line from george orwell's 1984 the opening line of orwell's 1984 it was a bright cold day in april and the clocks were striking 13. and Immediately, you know, we, we start with something that seems very much normal to our world. It was a bright, cold day in April. Yep, following along nicely. And the clocks were striking 13. And it's just the inclusion of the word 13 that immediately stops us in our tracks. We are arrested, We, as Tolkien would put it. We are stopped because clocks don't strike 13. Typically, yes, I am aware there are some clocks that do. But when we talk about this as if it is a normal thing, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. It's a very normal thing that's being relayed. The majority of clocks in this world do not strike 13 because striking refer, uh, implies mechanical clocks and mechanical clocks like grandfather clocks and all those sorts of things typically would strike one when you get to 13 on the 24 hour clock. And there is something unsettling about it striking 13. It creates an unease in the reader. So it is both a fantastic reality, but it creates unease. And so we can see that this isn't the, the arresting strangeness really that Tolkien kind of was talking about. We are still stopped. We are still, uh, we do feel this strangeness, but 
there's a sense of unease. And that's not the sort of the wondrous element that, that Tolkien was getting at. This is something slightly darker, something um, that is more concerned with tension. And so we can think of it more in terms of what Suvin was, say, talking about, this cognitive estrangement, because the concept of a clock striking 13 is strange to us. It doesn't make sense. Um, another literary term that basically literary theorists stole from elsewhere is cognitive dissonance. There is something wrong with that phrase striking 13. It stops us in our tracks. So what uh, Suvin would say is this estrangement, the dissonance that is created, uh, creates an estranging effect. We are removed from consideration of, of this is our reality. We're in a new place. There's a novum that has been added that is making us rethink time. It's making us rethink clocks. It's making us rethink the the structure of our days in a chronological or temporal sense. And all of that is done with using the number 13 instead of one. And again, one simple change. And yet Orwell creates something amazing and something different and something strange and something unsettling and so it's a very powerful technique and you can see why uh, this is used to such good effect in science fiction and fantasy then in this example the sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel now this is from william gibson's uh, neuromancer and weirdly enough if if you say that to people now the idea of a dead channel uh, either they think of the blue, that ethereal, weird uh, blue screen that you get when things aren't tuned in anymore, or it's, it can't find the channel that you're looking at. And if we think of the sky being like that, that's an unnatural color. It's a very artificial color. So this works as a descriptor that the sky above the port, and we're assuming, you know, a seaport, an airport, some sort of port, but usually linked to the sea was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. So we think of it as being a, an electric blue, which is an unnatural color. And it's uh, absolutely um, heterogeneous or uh, homogeneous. It, it is absolutely the same all the way through. There's no variation, there's no clouds, there's nothing to it. So we get an unnerving sense from this. And thinking about it in terms of say Suvin, this makes us rethink what is the sky? Uh, why is it the color of a dead channel? What is going on here? Why is the sky artificial? Why isn't the sky normal and natural? And it's suggesting a very strange world, uh, an odd world. It makes us rethink all of these sorts of concepts. Um, no, and this isn't going into the close reading of using things like dead channel and television as this sort of technology that is all going to feed into what Neuromancer is about and the use of technology and, and virtual realities and all this sorts of stuff. But just getting to that, it was the color of television. What color is, is television? And then it was television tuned to a dead channel. We are immediately stopped in our tracks. We go, this is really weird. This is unsettling. This is unnatural. What is going on? So a fantastic reality is created. An unnatural reality is created that is unsettling. And it's making us reconsider things. It's making us think about what the sky should be. Why do we assume the sky is X? Can you actually have the sky in that very artificial looking blue color? Now, all that being said, when Gibson wrote this, when a television wasn't tuned to a channel, it wasn't the blue screen of death. It was static. It was a visual static. These flecks of blue and gray, or sorry, uh, white, gray and black that flickered all over the screen. And it was a very odd pattern and uh, very unsettling. And you can see that that's even more arresting than the idea of a sort of mono blue artificial color that it would be very weird to imagine the sky being static, visual static, because that's just strange, that's just weird. And it makes you reconsider what reality is. So th this is one that because technology has changed, it's actually changed the meaning of this um, metaphor.
that Gibson is using. But it has something of the same effect. It's less effective now. It's less powerful now than it used to be. But it still has that element to it. And certainly because of it's a dead channel and because this is unsettling, it doesn't really fall into what uh, Tolkien was talking about in terms of the arresting strangeness that makes us stop and contemplate the beauty of this new creation. It is unsettling. And obviously, I couldn't talk about any of this without talking about an example from Tolkien himself. So, you know, this is the famous opening from The Hobbit. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. And as soon as you come to that word hobbit, you, you are stopped. This is strange. This is startling. This is weird. This is fantastic. And what Tolkien is trying to do is he starts with something that seems very bland, mundane, prosaic, normal in a hole in the ground. Yeah, we're following you so far. There lived a hobbit. A what? What's a hobbit? Uh, mm -hmm. And you stop. And then he follows it up with a, an ex a, a kind of explanation to slowly build out this, this meaning. And of course, the thing that we're concerned about is we don't know what a hobbit is. So what does Tolkien explain? Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell. And you go, Tolkien, I know what a hole is. I want to know what a hobbit is. Nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. Again, Tolkien, I know what a hole is. Stop focusing on the hole. I want you to tell me about the hobbit. The hobbit is the thing that I don't understand. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. And suddenly from this, you get this sense of, of Tolkien forestalling and playing out the tension of holding off on describing the fantastic element, but also giving you context to what's going on, because we know that hobbits are now uh, sort of synonymous with some aspect of comfort, that it's not the hole that you imagine you had somebody just dug a hole or a rabbit hole or a, a, a toad in a hole any of these things. But you can see what he kind of means by a, an expression that makes you stop and contemplate the world, this weird and wonderful world, and, and then go on this journey that is this fantastic reality. That's what Tolkien was kind of considering as arresting strangeness. And of course, from Suvin's perspective, the use of the term hobbit, and then the explanation we get about the whole, it's introducing the the novum and uh, the new thing of a hobbit into a discussion of what holes are causes this cognitive estrangement and we're actually estranged from what is going on this is a new reality a new thing and it's making us think about well what is this sort of hole is it even a hole what what is going on but you can see it fits more with what tolkien was talking about rather than what suvin was talking about but there are elements of both it is this introduction of a new thing, a fantastic thing, a novel, that calls into question the accepted reality. It creates a sense of an unreality or a fantastic reality. And then depending on how it is developed, it, it could fall into either of the sort of the two camps that we are discussing. So I thought I would show a more modern example, and this is from the, the prelude to Brandon Sanderson's The Way of Kings. And you can see how, again, in that opening sentence, Calic rounded a rocky stone ridge and stumbled to a stop before the body of a dying thunderclast. Um, and in a hole there lived a hobbit, ending on that um, fantastic phrase, the introduction of the fantastic immediately into the sentence, the end of the sentence, causes you to stop. It causes you to realise that this is not our world. It is not mimetic, that we are somewhere different. We are somewhere strange. And then what uh, Sanderson does is he then explains the fantastic element where Tolkien held off on this and actually teased it out to create that sense of wonder and what the hell is going on. Sanderson immediately starts telling you about the thunderclast itself. And this creates uh, a sense of ease in the reader. Yes, you had that moment of arresting strangeness. You had that moment of cognitive estrangement. But Sanderson immediately is at pains to try to explain to you to minimize the impact of this strangeness and to get you acclimatized to it as quickly as possible. 
and you know this has the effect of of making the the fantastic reality the baseline reality quickly as quickly as possible it changes the fantastic into the accepted reality very quickly uh, or it doesn't try to develop the tension that could be developed in this way it doesn't try to develop the fantastic nature in this way it tries to make the fantastic mundane by making it very very acceptable and knowable to the audience but the last example I wanted to get to here is from Steven Erickson's Midnight Tides. Now, we've seen how using very strange concepts or very strange words, we can create this cognitive estrangement. But I wanted to show this example, which is obviously, it's actually quite similar and opening to Sanderson's. And it's just done in a slightly different way because there isn't really a weird word that is triggering this because almost everything discussed in this opening seems relatively normal but the only strange thing is sky keeps and that would require explanation but it's not necessarily immediately estranging because we have things like planes that are called flying fortresses we have um concepts that it's the word sky, the word keep. We don't know what it is, but it's not a fantasy word. It's not a really weird concept. We're not sure what it is yet. It is just sky keeps. So it has that minor sense of unease about it. But what we have in this paragraph is pretty much straightforward, normal description. And yet, because of word choice, Erickson is building up tension and suggesting the fantastic without overtly spelling it out. So there's no hobbit here. There's no thunderclass here. There's no door dilating here. There's no clock striking 13. None of this is absolutely new to a concept of our world. And yet through the combination of a lot of subtle things, it creates the sense of the unreal. Because even blood rain down, you go, well, metaphorically, we have Saharan blood rains, um, even in biblical history, the, the, the rain of blood. But Saharan, I think it's Saharan uh, sand that is quite reddish and it can get blown up into the atmosphere. It can get into rain clouds and then you can have rains where it looks like it is raining blood. So from the twisting smoke filled clouds, blood rain down, it could be someone just waxing poetical. The last of the sky keeps. So again, sky keeps it slightly suggestive of something that's not from this world but at the same time we're not sure it's not something that is readily identifiable as alien as strange as new flame wreathed and pouring black smoke had surrendered the sky so we're now going well it was the it's these things in the sky and there's blood raining down and there's destruction their ragged descent had torn furrows through the ground as they struck and broke apart with thunderous reverberations we're getting a sense of scale and a sense of destruction scattering red stained rocks among the heaps of corpses that covered the land from horizon to horizon and now because of the sense of scale because of a, the sense of devastation because of the a sense of all of these small things the blood rain the sky keeps the um, emphasis on destruction and war and this fact that there are heaps of corpses from horizon to horizon, that this is on a scale that is unimaginable really in our world. This is where we get a sense of it being fantastic. This is where we get a sense of it being a new reality. And obviously it's not arresting strangeness in the way that Tolkien talked about, but it is a way of creating a fictional non-mimetic scene. And it's not cognitive estrangement in the way that Suvin spoke about. It's a different way of doing it. It's a combination of small things together that create a fantastic landscape. And this is another way of creating that idea of a fantastic landscape that feels as if it is the base level reality. Where Sanderson introduces a concept and goes, and you, I immediately know this concept is new and strange, so I'm going to explain it to you. And that way I can make you see this fantastic reality as the base level reality of the story. That's one way of doing it. 
putting the reader at ease by explaining every to everything to them as quickly as possible so they don't feel discombobulated they don't feel unease they don't feel tension they don't feel that i don't know what's going on feeling the other way of doing it is to create a sensory immersive experience that draws on tactile uh, all of the different senses both visual and auditory as well as the other senses to give you a sense that this world actually exists and it feels different to our world so it's another way of creating that reality so i think you can see the concepts of of cognitive estrangement and of arresting strangeness you can you can see why it's useful to know about because it helps us isolate those aspects in a text that do this and when you have a term for something when you know what the the word is or the phrase is to describe something it helps you notice it and identify it easier it, it becomes an easier aspect to sort of go oh i know what this is i know what i'm talking about this is this thing and then because you do that, because you understand it, you can then understand how it is being used and what effect it is creating. Whereas if you're unaware of it, it can make it vital. You sort of, you get a vague, it's something to do with this. This is the thing and it's doing this thing and it feels very vague and nebulous. But when you have the terms, the terms give us this handle on the situation. They make it more concrete. So that's why I think these things are useful. And then understanding the distinction between um, the movement from mimesis to diegesis and the movement from mimesis to the fantastic, again, gives us this sense of trying to understand, place and contextualise what is happening in the text. That we're not reduced to, oh, this is just a fantastic element. You go, well, what do you mean by fantastic? Or this is a, a fictional element. And you can feel how those words feel awkward in that sense. A fictional element, what, it doesn't exist, like the rest of the fiction. It's a fantastic element. Oh, you mean magic? No, uh, I mean fantastic as in not real, what, like fiction. Uh, you see the circularity of it, that it, it makes thinking about it harder because you don't have concrete terms and definitions to help sharpen and pinpoint exactly what it is that you're talking about. So it's not that you need these things. I think these things help and they help us think about the text. They help us think about what is going on in a text and what an author might be trying to do or trying to evoke or trying to achieve. And then that allows us even uh, an even better way of trying to establish whether or not an author has succeeded or failed. And that helps us evaluate a text. It helps us review texts. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I hope I, I, I haven't confused everyone. I, I think I was straightforward. But thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I'll see you in the next one.